four foundations of mindfulness way of practice the constituent factors in the practice of the four foundations of mindfulness are twofold the passive that which is focused on observed discerned and the active the act of observing paying attention insight <coughs> the passive constituents are those ordinary mundane things common to all of us the body and its movements, thoughts, feelings, etc., which exist or manifest in the present moment of awareness. <coughs> the active constituents are mindfulness, sati, and clear comprehension, sampadana, which are the principal factors in the practice of the four foundations of mindfulness. These two agents focus on and observe those things present in the mind unfalteringly and free from distraction. Mindfulness, sati, is that which keeps hold of the chosen object. Clear comprehension, sampajana, is the wisdom faculty which clearly discerns the nature and purpose of the object under investigation. For example, while, while walking one is mindful of and fully present of the movements of the body and simultaneously one knows clearly the reason for walking, the intended destination and the factors related to walking. Moreover, clear comprehension understands the object or the action as it is without coating it with preferences and aversions. <coughs> There is a matter of linguistic here, linguistics here that needs to be addressed. Some people misconstrue the common definition of sati as recollection <coughs> and the definition of sampajana as self-awareness, leading to misguided practice. They establish mindfulness on the sense of self and then have the impression that they are the agents for various actions, thinking. I am doing this, I am doing that. As a result, they create or reinforce the concept of self. They become preoccupied with this self-image and develop a rigidity of mind. At the very least, their minds are not truly focused on the activity and their efforts thus do not come to fruition. <coughs> Someone prone to such misunderstanding should recall the definition of sati as bearing in mind, sustaining attention on the object or task at hand, and sustaining attention on the flow of events. Similarly, one should recall the definition of sampajana as clear comprehension of an object of attention or clear comprehension of one's current activity. In other words, it is not a matter of focusing on the sense of self, I am doing this, rather than focusing on the performer of the task. One focuses on the task itself, one's attention is so present and focused that eventually there is no opportunity for a sense of self to interfere in the process. The essential feature of mindfulness is an accurate and distorted perception of things. One sees and understands what the object of awareness is, how it manifests and what effects it has in each moment. This entails a constant acknowledge, acknowledging, observing, contemplating and understanding. One does not react to the object, evaluate it, criticise it or judge it as being good or bad, right or wrong, etc. One does not paste one's emotions, biases or attachments onto the object, say as by being agreeable or disagreeable, satisfactory or unacceptable. One merely discerns how that object, condition or quality actually is without supplementing one's perception with, with such thoughts as 
mine, his, us, them, Mr. Crabtree, Mrs. Simpkins, etc. <coughs> Take the example of mindfulness of feelings, Vedana, in this very moment. One knows, for instance, that mental discomfort exists. One knows that it has arisen. One knows the way in which it c came about. And one knows how it is gradually dissipating. Similarly, one is mindful of mind objects, dhamma, ratmana. If worry or anxiety arises, one observes such emotions and contemplates how they have come about and how they unfold. If anger arises, the very awareness of this anger leads to its dissipation. One then reflects on that past anger, contemplating its advantages, its ill effects, its causes and its ending. Eventually it can become enjoyable to study, reflect on and investigate one's own suffering. When it is pure, unadulterated suffering arising and passing away, and there is no trace of my suffering or I am suffering, then that suffering is robbed of all its power to harm the one who contemplates it. Whatever form of virtue or vice exists externally or is present in the mind, one faces up to it without any evasion or avoidance. One pays close attention to it from the moment of its arising until it reaches its natural end. It is similar to watching actors perform a play or to being a bystander at some event. It is an attitude comparable to that of a doctor performing an autopsy or that of a scientist analysing a subject of research rather than that of a judge settling a case between plaintiff and defendant. It is an objective rather than a subjective approach. The constant application of mindfulness and clear comprehension implies living in the present moment. One is aware in each moment of what is arising, what is happening, or what one is doing. Attention does not slip. One does not attach to or linger over past events and one does not drift off into the future in search of things that do not yet exist. If some unresolved matter from the past or some future obligation should be considered, mindfulness lays hold of the relevant details and the wisdom faculty reflects on them in a purposeful way so that these matters become the present object of awareness. One does not get caught up in aimless thought, nostalgic reminiscence or fantasies of the future. By dwelling in the present moment, one is not enslaved, seduced or driven by craving. One lives wisely, freed from various forms of suffering, such as grief, regret, worry and depression. This way of life leads to an awareness accompanied by spaciousness, clarity and ease. Fruits of Mindfulness Practice Purity When mindfulness is focused on the chosen object and when clear comprehension understands that thing in its true light, then the stream of cognition and thought is purified. For there will be no room for mental defilements to arise. When one discerns phenomena simply as they are, without colouring the experience by emotions or reacting from personal prejudices and preferences, there is no clinging. This is a way to eliminate existing mental tents, asala, and to prevent newly founded tents from arising. Freedom. When the mind is purified as described above, it is also liberated. It is not shaken or disturbed by sense impressions because they are used as food for contemplation in a purely objective way. 
and these things are not misinterpreted by subjective mental taints, they have no power over people, and one's behaviour is freed from the controlling influence of unconscious drives and motivations. This is what is referred to by the passage, one abides independently, not clinging to anything in the world. Wisdom. When the mind is thus purified and liberated, wisdom functions most effectively, because the mind is not coated over or detracted by emotions, prejudices and biases. One then sees things as they are, according to the truth. Freedom from suffering. When this state of vigilance and true understanding of things is sustained, prejudicial responses, either in a negative or a positive sense, which do not accord with pure reasoned discernment, cannot arise. There are no feelings of covetousness, abidja, or resentment, domanasa, and there is a liberation from all forms of anxiety. This is called freedom from suffering, which is marked by unbounded clarity, ease, peace and contentment. Indeed, these four fruits of practice are interrelated, or they are aspects of the same thing. From the perspective of the teachings on dependent origination, Paticca Samapada, and on the three characteristics, Stila Kana, one can conclude the following up. At first, most people are ignorant of the fact that the so-called self they cling to is ultimately non-existent. People exist merely as a continuum of myriad interrelated and interdependent physical and mental phenomena which are continually, which continually arise, transform and disperse. When one is unaware of this truth, one clings to emotions, thoughts, desires, habits, opinions, beliefs, perceptions, etc. In any one moment, and one identifies with these. The resulting sense of a self undergoes the constant transformation. One thinks, I was that, now I am this, I felt that way, now I feel this way. To engage in such self-identification is to be deceived by such things as thoughts and feelings, which are merely subsidiary mental factors, nama dhamma, active in that particular moment. This deception of, is the source of wrong thinking. As a consequence, one's thoughts, feelings and actions are motivated and driven by the extingencies of whatever is being clung to as self at the moment. When one practices in line with the foundations of mindfulness, one sees each material and mental component within a specific process as arising and ceasing according to its own nature. By analysing and distinguishing each factor of this moment-to-moment -moment continuum, one is not deceived into grasping onto things and identifying with them as self. These things thus lose their power of coercion. If this insight attains an optimum profundity and clarity, one realises liberation. The mind is established in a new mode of being, which is pure, spacious, free from mental bias and attachment. Even one's personality is altered. This is a state of perfect mental health. It is comparable to a body which is in perfect health when in the absence of disease, all of its organs function smoothly and normally. Indeed, the practice of the four foundations of mindfulness is a method of cleansing the mind of mental illness, of completely eliminating those things that restrict, obstruct and impede the mind. A person is then prepared to face and deal with all things in the world resolutely with, and with joy. This matter may be summarised with the following teachings by the Buddha. Monks, there are two kinds of illness, physical illness and mental illness. There are two 
there are to be seen beings who can assert to be without illness of the body for an entire year. There are to be seen beings who can assert to be without illness of the body for two years, three years, four years, five years, ten years, twenty years, thirty years, forty years, fifty years, a hundred years. But beings who can assert to be without illness of the mind, even for an instant, are difficult to find in the world, with the exception of those who are free from the tents. Venerable Sariputta, householder, your faculties are bright, your facial complexion is pure and radiant. Did you get to hear a Dharma talk today in the presence of the Blessed One? Makula Pita, why not, Venerable Sir? Just now I was anointed by the Blessed One with the ambrosia of a Dharma talk. Venerable Sariputta, in what manner did the Blessed One anoint you with the ambrosia of a Dharma talk? Nakula Pita, here, Venerable Sir, I approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, sat down to one side, and said to him, I am old, Venerable Sir, aged, burdened with years, advanced in life, afflicted in body, often ill. I rarely get to see the Blessed One and the bhikkhus who are a cause for delight. Let the Blessed One exhort me, Venerable Sir, let him instruct me, since that would lead to my welfare and happiness for a long time. The Buddha replied, So it is, householder, so it is. This body is afflicted, like an egg which is covered by a shell. If anyone carrying around this body were to claim to be without illness even for a moment, what would this be other than foolishness? Therefore, householder, you should train yourself thus. Even though I am afflicted in body, my mind will be unafflicted. It was the ambrosia of such a Dhamma talk, Venerable Sir, that the Blessed One anointed me. Momentary awareness is essential for insight meditation. People's most ordinary mundane activity, one that is going on constantly in their daily lives, is the cognition of sense impressions through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body and mind. Cognition is always accompanied by a feeling, either of pleasure, pain or a neutral feeling. In response to feelings, the mind reacts. If the object is pleasant, there arises desire and delight. If the object is unpleasant or painful, there arises annoyance and aversion. When there is liking of something, one wishes to experience more of it, to repeat the enjoyment, to obtain or possess the object. When there is dislike of something, one wishes to escape from it, to rid oneself of it or destroy it. This process is continuing all the time, both on subtle levels which tend to remain unobserved and on occasion with an intensity which is plainly recognisable and which inflicts clearly discernible and lasting effects on the mind. These powerful or unsettling experiences tend to generate long and involved mental proliferations and if they are not resolved they intrude into the whole range of one's speech and actions. <coughs> People's lives, their roles in society and their interactions with others issue primarily from this incessant contact with sense impressions which is present in every moment of human existence. Heedlessly abandoning the mind to the process of delighting in pleasure and comfort and resisting pain and discomfort impedes the development of wisdom. One will be prevented from discerning the true nature of things. A lack of restraint in this matter creates the following obstacles. The mind falls under the sway of liking and disliking and it gets stuck at these points of reaction. One's vision is thus obscured and one sees things from a biased perspective, not according to how they truly are. 
the mind falls into the past or drifts into the future when one experiences a sense impression and either delight or aversion arises the mind gets stuck at the point or feature of that object that is considered agreeable or disagreeable one then makes a mental image of these agreeable or disagreeable features nourishes it and proliferates it dwelling on particular agreeable or disagreeable aspects of something and clinging to concepts or images of it. It is equivalent to slipping into the past, the ensuing mental proliferations of these images until drifting off into the future. A person's understanding of the object, the mind created images based on likes and dislikes or the embellished ideas about it is in fact not a true understanding of the object as it truly exists in the present moment. The mind is subject to proliferation, proliferated thinking, which interprets the meaning of what is sensed or experienced in the light of one's personal history or ingrained habits, example, according to one's cherished views, values and opinions. The mind is at the mercy of these proliferations it is unable to see things objectively and purely as they are. The mind adds embellished mental images of new experiences to one's pre-existing mental biases and habits, thus compounding one's habitual patterns of reaction. The negative characteristics of mind mentioned above do not pertain only to the coarse and shallow matters of one's daily life and general affairs. The Buddhist teachings emphasize their manifestation at the subtle and profound level of the mental continuum. It is through their presence that ordinary unawakened beings are led to see things as stable and substantially real, to perceive inherent beauty or ugliness in them, to attach to conventional truths and to overlook the all-encompassing law of causality. People accumulate habits and conditioned tendencies of misperceiving existence almost from the day they are born and go 20 or 30 years, 40 or 50 years, even longer than that, without ever training themselves to break the cycle of wrong thinking. Dealing with and rectifying this situation is thus not easy. At the very moment that one becomes conscious of an object, one bef before one has had time to steady oneself to check the process, the mind is already switched into a habitual response. The remedy in this case is not simply a matter of cutting a cycle of reactivity and abrogating a conditioned process, but also necessitates curbing the habitual tendencies and dispositions of the mind that flow strongly along fixed channels. Mindfulness is an essential factor here for clearing the way and for marshalling other spiritual factors. The practice of the four foundations of mindfulness has the following objectives. Through mindfully keeping pace with the experience and seeing things in their bare actuality, one breaks the circuit of deluded thought, destroys unwholesome and mental dynamics, modifies old conditioning and cultivates new dispositions in the mind. A mind possessing such moment-to-moment -moment awareness is endowed with characteristics which are the complete antithesis of those shown by a mind caught up in the flow of unwholesome conditioning. Attachment and aversion have no opportunity to arise in the mind because their presence is dependent on the mind seizing on and lingering over a particular point or aspect of an object and thus being caught up in the present in the past. Attachment and aversion exist when there is a following away from the present moment 
a consequence of a free, unentangled mind, which observes things as they arise from moment to moment, is that it does not slip into the past or drift off into the future. The mind is not subject to mental proliferations based on past conditioning, which lead to a biased, distorted and coloured experience of phenomena. The mind is prepared to see things as they truly are. <coughs> the mind does not compound or intensify bad habits. When one pays attention to phenomena as they arise in each moment, one perceives certain character traits in oneself which are unwelcome or unacknowledged. With mindfulness one can face up to these qualities as they are, without seeking to avoid them and without any self-deception. One is thus able to cleanse such impurities from the mind and to solve personal difficulties. The mind endowed with constant mindfulness is unconstricted and untarnished. It is pure, radiant, spacious, joyous and free. All things exist and proceed according to their own nature. Figuratively speaking, the truth is revealed, is revealing itself at all times, yet people tend to shut themselves off from it. Alternatively, they see things in a distorted manner or deceive themselves as to the nature of truth altogether. The cause for this concealment, distortion and deception is the immersion in the conditioned stream of heedless abandon to pleasure and discomfort detailed above. The factors for distortion and delusion are strong in themselves. Add to these the compulsive or and misleading power of habit and the chance to really know the truth is almost non-existent. Because personal habits and dispositions have been accumulated steadily over an extremely long period of time, the practice to remedy them and to create a new mode of relating to the world is also likely to require a long time. Whenever mindfulness is consistent and proficient, when one does not evade the truth, does not distort the things one sees and escapes the power of old conditioning. When it's prepared to see things as they are and to understand the truth. At this point, if other spiritual qualities, especially wisdom, are well developed, they will join forces with mindfulness by re relying on it to operate in the most effective way, giving rise to knowledge and vision, yana dasana, which is the goal of insight meditation. To gain mastery in wisdom and in other spiritual faculties, however, depends on gradual training and on basic study. Study and reasoned analysis, therefore, are supportive for the realization of truth.